today's topic is going to be intro to risks in DeFi. And we have seen, yesterday was a very interesting debatacle of whatever that's going with Faye and a lot of different kind of risks involved in DeFi. So today we want to dive a little bit deeper into that. So Zia, do you want to come in and introduce yourself first? So my name's Zia. I run a fund, um, an incubator called Matterblock um, with my partner, um, Erhan. Um, I've been in the space since about 2015 uh, professionally and 2013 um, kind of personally. And uh, 2015, I started a company with a couple of co-founders and um, moved over to China, built that company um, up uh, until about 2018 um, when we exited um, in the in the bear which was great but uh, but uh, but it was an exit nonetheless and then since then I've been working um, kind of quite intimately with projects and um, and VCs and recently started uh, the Matterbot fund so that's that's me awesome and I'll just introduce myself a little my name is Lisa and I am in the space for about three years four years now and I came into the space as an economist trying to figure out how do I build very robust economic systems from a primary market? Because one of the coolest thing that is different that we have in the crypto space and we don't have in the equities market, for instance, is this circular economy or this closed looped economy where we can design the systems. We can build blueprints and architecture to make sure that this outcome of the system is towards a more social optimal outcome and we can do this with tokens tokens being the main incentive driver to change and affect people's behaviors in the space so that's the general idea of how i came to the space then my company's economics design we do consulting we do research we do education and it is super fun to be in the space and working with very very bright people to be creating new models for to change the future that we live in but one of the things that we come back again again in this chat room and with a lot of other projects is risks. There are a lot of risks when it comes to DeFi. And if I could break them down into three different categories, and maybe Zia, you can, you can let me know if you, what you think about this. The three different risks are, first is technical risk. So technical risk is because a lot of these operations now are systemized. They're in code. Execution is in code. And so there can be bugs in code. There can be exploits in code. So this technical risk is something that's quite new that we don't see in the more of the physical world that we're used to. The second risk is exploit risks or economic exploits. So economic exploits, as I mentioned, when we're building these new systems, these systems are different because we can design the economics of it. We can define the rules of it. It's almost like I'm designing my own Newtonian physics in a different planet. So I can design all these rules governing the system. And these rules are economic rules. And this could be where bad actors could come in. This is where you can exploit the system. And lastly, we have price volatility, which is a risk always when it comes to finance. So Zia, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, I think you know, you're, you're quite spot on uh, with the three kind of main overarching uh, kind of umbrellas of risk. I think within them, there's, you know, there's, there's kind of nuances as well that kind of s- sort of sit sit underneath um, each of those you know when you talk about kind of economic risk you've also got like geographic economic risk right like um and and certain like geopolitics yeah you know like geopolitics and things like that so that you know that's kind of like um because we're talking in a, a global space it's you know that's a really um i guess interesting one that kind of sits under economic economic risk and um you know technical risk kind of runs the gamut you know because because there's there's different levels of vulnerabilities within the defi stack like tech stack so so you know each of these um is like a you know really good umbrella but it's you know it's, it's actually quite complex underneath um, those umbrellas as to the different nuances and the different um, factors within within each of those um, those kind of overarching um, levels of risk. That's my take on it. When we talk about geopolitic risks and macroeconomic risks, which I wouldn't, would you consider them as part of something that DeFi considers? Because we live in the, or at least all of these systems, they live in the digital world and we are not exactly regulated 
So, and everyone works across jurisdictions, across geography, and there isn't much, there isn't a, a physical location in which everyone has to work in. So what kind of macroeconomic risk are we thinking about that will affect how, for example, perpetual futures will be used in one of these DeFi protocols? Well, I mean, we've seen that we've seen that um, that geopolitics uh, does does affect, you know, directly affects, um, I guess, the price um, of of assets. Uh, you know, we we, we talk about, um, for instance, you know, you, you talk about we're we're not um, we're not necessarily legislated or um, compliance and it isn't isn't. The same across um, across geographies, but but when um, you know when a certain government or um, authority kind of announces they're going to get involved or or wants to get involved, that that certainly has, does have a, an effect. We've seen that um, historically, um, and then you know you also you also think about uh, it, it, the kind of weight that certain um that certain geographies might hold and um in inabilities to to kind of um coordinate attacks and things like that um that's certainly something that i think isn't spoken about that much but it definitely exists so um when you think about um russia and china in particular so yeah i i do think it's a factor and i i completely get obviously you know we're talking about decentralized finance, so there's not one location. However, um, you know, I think geopolitics and location does factor in to to a certain level, certainly under kind of price risk. Yeah, absolutely agree with that, especially when it comes to attack vectors, because economic exploits as a risk is also really not just about bad actors, but bad actors in huge numbers. And when you can coordinate bad actors more easily in a physical off-chain world, then the, high, the probability of economic exploits can be a lot larger. So let's dive a little bit into economic exploits and you know what are examples of economic exploits. I'll just list a few, and then we can discuss a little bit more about what's examples of them. So I would say one of them will be gamifying the system, which is interesting because when you're building these systems, you are actually gamifying them for like a greater good or for like a social good. But where it becomes an exploit is where you're gaming the system for your individual benefit instead of benefiting everyone. The second, as we mentioned before, is bad actors, you know, bad miners or validators coming coming and attacking the system. You've got civil attacks. For example, um, we have new models like quadratic funding to be allocating funds to different people. And there are a lot of different kind of attacks that you could you could establish in these kind of models or new models. Thirdly, a lot of systems might not be robust enough. So when it comes to economics, it's more than just demand supply and token allocation or token distribution. There are a lot of mechanisms to think about, a lot of design, mechanism design and token design, monetary policy added into the system to ensure that it's a little bit more robust. But these are almost like secondary and tertiary effects of all the economic systems being built. And it's kind of hard to quantify or qualify if a system is robust or not. So this checking of economic exploits is probably is one of the risks as well because we have no idea how to check them. And lastly, we, we always, I think that it, when we're designing all the systems, especially in economic exploits, we kind of assume that people are rational behaviors. So if prices fall, it's okay, the community will, will continue to hold or the community will dump because prices, because prices are not stable anymore. And what we are ignoring is the behavioral aspect where people are actually irrational. So how do you build that into the system? So a case in point will be FAE, the FAE protocol that's going on. Zia, do you know anything about the FAE protocol? I only just kind of caught up on it. Um... Uh, what's happening with it kind of recently um and I, I i've been interestingly i'd heard a lot about say prior kind of people going on about it but um i i only just saw what's kind of happened with it um 
in, in, in the last couple of days. So I'm not kind of totally up to speed on, what, on what's going on. Okay, let me just summarize a little bit about what Faye is doing. So Faye is a stablecoin protocol. So it's sta Faye is supposed to be a stablecoin and they have this other governance token, a community token called Tribe. So how it launched, or the entire system is interesting because it's quarterly or a little bit backed by reserves. So that's cool. And that helps to maintain the pricing. How it launched, one of the biggest issues with launching stable coins is that you need usability. So you need to bootstrap your community. So how they do that is for early users, they can come in at a discount and they can buy in at like 50 cents when Faye will be trading at $1. That's the idea. So um, that was designed by a bonding curve. A lot of people talked about it. They raised a lot of money and they raised money through ETH. So that's all great. And that was that was fine. It was very hype. Everyone loved, everyone liked and put money in or put ETH in. Now, now the, the thing went live. And what happened is that I don't think, I don't know if this is considered an economic exploit, but it was, it was overly subscribed. It was overly subscribed. And I think they raised $1.3 billion worth of ETH. And it's, it's much greater than the systems or the mechanism was designed to do. So one of the interesting things that they added into the FAY model is that, yes, you can, you, you're trading with Uniswap to get the $1. You're trading ETH and FAY. And the other, the other interesting like little point that is different from Faye and other projects is that with Faye you have to pay almost like a taxation um, penalty. So if Faye is less than one dollar, so prices drop and people are more inclined to want to liquidate because if my Faye is less than one dollar, I don't really want to hold Faye because it, it doesn't make any sense for me to hold Faye. So I want to sell it and I want to cut my losses, but and to disincentivize people from doing that, they add the tax taxes to that. So you have to pay, let's say, um, fourteen percent taxes. So you're losing fourteen cents when you're trading. And to incentivize people to put more money in when you're trading ETH for Fay, you get more Fay as a result. So that's the general idea. And the thing is, the part of irrational behavior and irrational people is that once they think that Fay is just dropping, a lot of complaints on Discord, a lot of complaints on Twitter. And faith, the the community faith of faith, <laughs> that's a funny pun, is it's not as high anymore. And people started dumping, and prices are just plummeting like crazy. So this is a very interesting risk that we don't really think about and we don't see until the community has tried and tested it. Have you seen other situations like that in the space, Zia? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean. I think, uh, you know, anything about DeFi, like one of the one of the main things about DeFi is, of course, community. So um, a lot of projects, like you know, they'll live or die um, on on you know on their communities. Uh, that is both you know a positive and a negative in 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 um you know in our space. Like that's something I think that anybody who's starting uh, a project or, or, or a protocol needs to to kind of fully understand so to me it's it's a little I guess naive on behalf of um, and you know I'm, I'm I'm kind of hearing the info I can have from you but it seems like uh, to me that's a little naive for the uh, for the I guess founders of this project to expect that there won't be FUD based on you know there not being enough liquidity to to um to sell Faye when 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 Faye looks like it's it's plummeting i mean that that seems that seems insane to me uh, and the mechanics obviously were not as as well thought out for every um eventuality or possibility so um whilst i'm sure you know the the project is is uh, you know, there's some smart people behind it, and certainly I know I, I know some of the investors behind it, and they're very smart people. Um, I don't know that um, they fully kind of thought out all the risks, uh, and certainly this, yeah, I, 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 you know, humans are humans, right? Like, and regardless of 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 of, of anything, 
there's fundamentals about humans that that you're you're never going to be able to um engineer really yeah so that needs to be a consideration um when you're you're building these things in right like fundamentals like um like greed like um you know um irrationality as you as you mentioned they these are all fundamentals that we can't engineer even even with with a, a level of social engineering right so so it's it's i think potentially naive on the part of some of some um project founders and i do and i do think that does exist you know um quite a lot in in the space because uh, a lot of us have quite idealistic ideas about what we could do with DeFi, and i'm one of them you know i've spoken before about being very um very optimistic about what we can do but um but there will always always be those those fundamentals in human behavior that i think affect affect that um in terms of another project that that's kind of had this i think there's there's multiple there's multiple projects that have lived and died on their communities and and the amount of fud that exists in the communities have 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 really had a detrimental effect on on projects and it's really about how they handle that you know we've seen quite a lot of exploits recently um but you know i think like somebody like alpha finance they had an exploit a, a while back i mean this is this is slightly different from an exploit obviously um but the way they handled it was really uh i think a, a good benchmark for how you should handle something like that so yeah it's really about how they how they handle it from here on out Joshua, do you want to add anything before I continue? Yeah, I was. It was just like the in regards to Faye. Um, it, it's almost like the structure for when it was under peg, like created a situation of like when LP faces impermanent loss and just like how, and almost like how like cascading liquidations work in in DeFi, where like once one person sells, like then it just has these like crazy effects and they and there's like a bunch of other issues where they had like um or or there was like another issue where like you couldn't you couldn't swap um tribe for eth in the beginning as well like there was no pool for that so like you had to go through fey and and it just seemed that and i i feel like there was some like just resentment from a lot of crypto twitter for them getting as much liquidity as they initially got in the beginning and then like once one person like once like one like crypto twitter influencer tweeted something negative it was like basically just like a barrage and it was like oh i was right because i didn't um because i didn't uh invest in this and then it was like i don't know it was almost it almost got, got to it. the point where yeah but yeah, it, it was just interesting yeah, interesting I, uh, to see. Uh, it's only a week old too, so time. Will yeah, and, and that's the kind of, I guess, interesting thing about tribalism in the space, isn't it? It's like, and <laughs> and 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 how and how um, you know all these different factors like crypto Twitter can really ha have an effect. It's 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 unlike any other kind of um, financial system. That's why you know it's so exciting. That that's why it's so interesting. Um, but yeah, I I, I think. Um, you know and, and and then the other thing is that you mentioned like you know twitter influences and things like that and they all want to be right right so it's the sooner they can shout about oh you know i was right about this or blah blah i guess it's a really interesting thing so tribalism is it you know a huge a huge deal and i think um you know sort of to what i was talking about before it's now about like how they handle it and if it wasn't you know it maybe it's not as bad as as everybody's saying it is and and it's really just them managing that um, but I do think that needs to be built in a lot earlier um, into in, uh, into projects thinking. Like they need to to kind of factor in an element of that, um, a level of understanding as to how it might go, um, because there's always going to be people that um, that are kind of naysayers. So how they manage that and and like you say, that, that cascading effect. It's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest risks, this cascading effect of, I call them doom loops, because all you need is like a domino effect of one big Twitter influencer just saying that this project is not doing well. Everyone just apes into their belief without even doing any research. So if you look at a lot of complaints on Twitter, you realize that a lot of people didn't even understand what Faye was about. 
they just aped into the system because some influencers or some big VCs they decided that hey, Faye is something that we're putting money in. You want to, if you want to put money in, put it with us. And so a lot of people just put money in without figuring out how it works. And today, there's the other side of the influencers saying that this system is not is not right. There were a lot of screenshots of things that were not robust enough, and then there were a lot of complaints. And the the doom loop just goes in a the the doom loop is in in growing growing insanely fast. It's exponential. It's it's a bit scary in this space. And I think it all still boils down to education and do your own research. That's something that we talk a lot about in the space. And I would say that that's also one of the risks because what is do your own research? What are you supposed to research? So if we go back to what Zia was talking about with Alpha Finance. I love the project. Very, very smart people. And there was a technical risk that was going on, which is a lot easier to manage because it's returning the funds to people. It's subsidizing their losses. It's show me the code, what went wrong, doing the whole um, like recovery, recovery, recovery kind of like system when there are technical failures. So this is something that exists in the kind of world that we're very used to anyway. But economic exploits are something new. And it's very hard for people to even research about that. Like, what are you supposed to do when you research about Faye and you wouldn't expect this kind of things from happening. Even the team probably didn't expect this kind of things from happening. How would you, how do you deal with these kind of risks? Yeah, it's a really tough one. And I think, um, you know, more than any other, obviously, more than any other financial system, the onus is on the individual, right? Like in DeFi, it's, all, it's, 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 it's balanced to the individual to to manage their levels of risk um you know a lot more than centralized systems of course um yeah uh, this is this is where it gets tough right because you have a lot of people that that are, are coming into the space um and and most of us um in the space like that because we want you know we want more mass we want more adoption we want mass adoption we want um you know we want this space to grow um but there is a it, it is quite a steep learning curve i think for people um so to add in you know all these complex complexities around different types of risk and with this one you know being um being kind of new and 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 almost it's harder to quantify, right? Like you, you know, you're talking about like we're quantifying X, Y, Z in this technical um, exploit. We know that X, Y, Z happened um, and um, that resulted in this. Um, with an economic exploit, it's it's kind of a, a almost like a jumbled um, combination of or, uh, economic risk, sorry, ju like a jumbled combination of things. Like Joshua was mentioning, um, you know, a... a a influencer on Twitter tweeted this and then this happened and then this happened and your doom loop kind of cycle started. And um, so it, it, it is, it is difficult. And I think it's, um, it, it is interesting though, that, you know, these are still data points, right? So um, it, 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 the, the fact that a tweet, I guess it's cut. It is a data point. Like you can take that as a piece of data, and that's a data point, and then resulting kind of factors that they're all data points, right? But um, how do you quantify them? Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. But that's about what I was about about to say. Is it, it, it that's difficult to then put into a formula to kind of quantify and to say, um, well, these things happen, and 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 model. That's a really difficult thing to model. Whereas with um, I guess other factors of risk, they're easier to model and to to I guess um, come to come to some sort of understanding around. Uh, so it's very complex. Um, I don't have I don't have the answer in terms of um, what how you do that in a very effective way. I think that as we as we kind of mature even more, we're going to find there may be some patterns, and I think that will start to I guess reveal themselves and they'll start to reveal themselves and perhaps then we can we can kind of model some data around it but yeah it's it's a difficult one this is just like me speculating but specifically with Faye it seemed like because they got so much like ETH like 
subscribe to them on the Genesis launch that like possibly maybe some like people that subscribed early on that didn't think that it was going to get as subscribed as it did um, were like became like bearish after they saw like I forget how much ETH it was. It was like it it was it was a, quite I think a bit. It's one point three uh, billion dollars worth of ETH. Yeah, and and they thought like it was going to maybe be like I don't know two hundred million or three hundred million or something like that. From my understanding, so like once they saw that, then then like I don't know. It, it seemed like there wasn't. Ne- yeah, that that like factor because there was no cap didn't necessarily go into consideration, and then um. And and then them like describing it as like I don't know I have like mild skepticism when someone or I now have more mild skepticism when someone's like this is a fair launch because like there are people that get in like on the seed and before that so but we'll we'll see it's it's also like so early um, but just just from like a valuation standpoint the like how big it is um, just relative like it, it it's like bigger than Maker or I think diluted um, and just how big maker is from like an infrastructural standpoint um, for Ethereum and, and like DeFi is, yeah, it's just interesting. Yeah, completely agree. Which really brings me to the next big topic that I want to talk about, which is price volatility and financial risk. So we covered three main risks so far. We have technical risk. So stuff like systems, systems exploit, execution in code, failure in code, and we have seen that in Alpha Finance, we've seen that in the Opium Protocol, we've seen that in a lot of different bugs that exist. And these bugs usually exist when they're trans- transferring from one system to another system, so one smart contract to another smart contract, or upgrading the smart contract, and there's just some bugs over there. The other risk that we've been talking about now is the economic exploits. So how do you measure that? How do you quantify these kind of risks that exist? How do you even quantify these unknown risks, because these are a lot of things that's in secondary and tertiary order effects that you can't really measure. So that's something to really start thinking about. And then the third risk is also more like the education research risk, where you've got influencers saying this thing works or this thing doesn't work and people just follow them without understanding what's going on. Or even people who are very new in the space, the barrier to entry is actually quite high. As much as I want to say this is decentralized finance, the systems are decentralized, but the knowledge is still pretty centralized within a subsegment of people. And that's one of the different risks where we're trying to make to bring DeFi into mainstream. So this brings up to the main point of, of financial risk and price volatility. I think this is a big, big, big risk in DeFi. Not just the price side of the output, but the input of what goes in into defining the price of the output. So I think Zia, you have a lot of experience in this aspect. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, what's, so yeah, I think, I think, you know, obviously price and, for, and volatility is, is huge, right? Like it's, it's one of the, yeah, the biggest, um, the biggest risk around around this you know getting losing losing all your money is <laughs> it's not fun um but i think that you know unlike um other other kind of things of risk like there is a lot of work that you could do to really mitigate that um and and to your point like the the knowledge is still really centralized. I think that was a really interesting point because it's like, you know, the, you really do have to spend time. And a lot of people are coming from from kind of industries that have nothing to do with finance and, you know, individual investors, and this is all great. Um, and But they don't understand fundamentals of, of finance and uh, fundamentals of um I guess of price of economics. And of economics, exactly fundamentals of economics, and and these are all things that actually you really need to kind of have a grasp on, um, in order to 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 not lose money in in this space. Really, um, yes. you know, it, it, uh, I I don't have a financial um, a financial background, but I you know I did do um, an international business and economics degree. Um, 
and and so you know there's there's some fundamentals that i that i understand there um so i'm not i'm not like you know from from wall street or anything but i certainly have understanding and i think you know whether it's through experience or through education it's really important to to kind of understand those fundamentals because there are some basic fundamentals that that you can apply that that make sense in defi right like it's not it's not so alien that that uh, basic fundamentals don't apply uh but i think you know what we're seeing is a, a huge um uh kind of sway the people that come in that don't understand that and that actually you know in itself um has a has a risk risk factor uh that in itself has an effect and potentially um uh on on the volatility actually um so i think there's a there's a um a responsibility um on on us to kind of get better at that somehow and to to really uh, start to do a lot more work on that and how we manage that and how we manage people coming into the space so that it doesn't become um that doesn't aff affect kind of you know the price uh, um overly i, I think the, you know the other thing is like obviously we're in a we're in a hype cycle right now with so much within the space um and and everybody who's been in in the space for a long time realizes that right but um but how how much of the people that are are kind of jumping into that hype how how, how many of them realize that um and 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 yeah so i think there's there's a lot there's a lot to think about there um in terms of you know in terms of investments and the way that that we we look at investments you know we we really kind of factor everything into the investments we make and we've spoken about this before um lisa about you know kind of me making my decision quite quickly and then and then yeah. going into and, and then going into the risks associated with that decision uh, and and i think um i think you know having a model whether you're a personal investor or a or an institutional investor or a venture investor um having a model and a thesis that you stick to um that's that's what's worked for us and that's what you know we we kind of if it doesn't fit that we don't do it um and i think even personally investors individual investors should should kind of think about that for themselves unfortunately i don't think a lot of them do yeah a lot of them don't and it goes back to the knowledge that you're talking about when so i would say that the four main domain knowledge that's very important in the field is number 1 finance number 2 economics number 3 technology number 4 math and usually you can find people who are good at two or three but to be good at all that's something that i think it's quite important and that's why the barriers to entry is so high because each of these four fields, it's not easy. And to be you know, a personal investor, to have the thesis, to have the analysis, to have the framework, to understand how good the model is, to calculate the, the different kind of risks, because going back to one of the first risks, that's technical risk, a lot of these execution is done in code. It's formalized in mathematics. So based on that, we can model things a lot better in figuring out what kind of exploits are there, how dangerous things are, you can start quantifying these risks. And that is quite hard to do. It's just even hard to understand what's going on and how do they define these kind of systems. And then you want to make predictions, you want to quantify risk. That's it's kind of difficult. And then with finance, finance is not easy. It's good that this situation, together with whatever GameStop is happening is doing, and all these different failures in traditional finance, everyone is just learning a lot more about finance. And I think that's a very good thing. At the same time, we also realize that finance is not very easy. And that's why people go to school and take degrees of, in finance to understand what's going on. And right now, the space is also, at least in DeFi, it's also getting more complicated because we're moving beyond the, the low-hanging finance routes. So that's exchanges, that's creation of stable coins, that's lending and borrowing. We're moving on to a little bit more complex structures like options and futures and different kind of derivative structures, risk trenching. And these are huge opportunities, huge growth market, 
but also very, very complex to understand how they work, to understand how things are being executed. So that's tough. And lastly is the economic risk, which I still think, or the economic knowledge, which I think is very, very important because we talked about irrational behaviours, we talked about bad actors, we talked about doom loops, we talked about different kind of gamification of risk, and how do you manage that? How do you quantify that? That's really hard. And all these are just inputs. All these are inputs to figure out how the output of price would be. Then that's where the volatility of the risk volatility of price comes in. And it's just really, really, really hard. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's kind of what I'm what I was sort of talking about with that with that model, you know. It's it's these are these are inputs and there are so many inputs um to get the output and 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 so you know what do you factor in um and, and because it's complex you know and we've even at the top of the at the at the call we, you know we spoke about the overarching risks and then within those risks all the nuances that sit underneath and so yeah it, it's a complex system and i think um again you know i'm very optimistic i've always been optimistic um i think that that what we'll see in the future is you know sh potentially a little bit of a shift away from um from the the need for the learning curve and i think as we get better at um at building these products that serve people with, as we get better at, at um at mitigating the risks at a higher level we'll be able to kind of get to that we'll be able to get to those points where there isn't a learning curve that's what i want to get to i want us to get to a point where people interact with um you know DeFi project products without having to 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 do that um, risk assessment themselves um at such a high level so um i do think we'll get there there's a lot more work to be done but but i i think i think we'll eventually get there you know i want us to to have that um that level of of i guess integration into the mainstream um and i think a lot of smart people are working on on things that will help to do that um but certainly i think that the the weight of risk management um needs to be uh i guess sort of more heavily um uh, heavily managed by by projects and um and and people who are who are kind of really deeply in the space and whether that's through DAOs or um and governance and, and more of that i think that's probably the way to go because obviously you know we want to keep it decentralized but um but yeah i think there there are systems that we can that we can build that will help us to do that um more effectively if there are three main sectors in DeFi where you want where you can build very good risk management or managing risk which will be the three fields you think are the most critical so for example fields will be um all segments will be exchanges insurance derivatives yeah so, so yeah so i think uh, you know i i certainly think um exchanges and dexes um is is a big one uh like i said you know we need to of course keep it decentralized so i'm not suggesting you know that that kind of changes but yeah i think uh exchanges um insurance protocols are, uh, are getting better i think there's um there's a little bit of a piecemeal um approach at the moment with insurance um I guess in terms of not necessarily looking at the problems holistically, which you know is kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the with the very, uh, with the great complexities around it. So, so I think you know uh, as we mature, those insurance uh, protocols will will get more sophisticated and 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 look at it more with a more holistic lens. Um, and then I guess the the last one would be. Uh, would be yeah derivatives um and um uh, and and kind of the ecosystems around that uh, those would be the three i think off the top of my head yeah i like that you brought up decentralized exchanges or exchanges because i think that's absolutely one of the most important areas 
in fact, probably the most important one where we need to start thinking more about risks because there are two ways people can enter the crypto space. You either own the tokens already or you find a way to exchange to get those tokens. So either airdrop by getting the tokens or you have something, you have, let's say, Bitcoin and you, you chain it to red Bitcoin and then you exchange it within the within Uniswap and enter the DeFi world. So that becomes like a gateway to getting people in. And since that is the gateway where people are entering the DeFi ecosystem, that's where risk management is super, super, super important because that's the first encounter where people are exposed to. And there are a lot of innovation in the, the decentralized exchange space, which is very, very great. And one of the latest one is Uniswap version 3, where they're combining liquidity pools that we are very familiar with in the DeFi world and central limit order books, clubs in the, the traditional finance world. And so they're bringing that together. And I think a lot, there are a lot of complaints about liquidity, uh, impermanent loss and um, risk of being liquidity provider, having your assets liquidated and everything. What do, you, do you have any thoughts on what the risk of these kind of new systems are or new mechanisms? Um, yeah, so I've, I've, I've been thinking a little bit about impermanent loss uh, recently and I know that, uh, a few smart teams that are trying to kind of solve, um, solve for that. Um, yeah, I think it's it's interesting because again, it's kind of a it's kind of a onus on the individual very much again, especially with impermanent loss. But at the same time, you know, if you if you are willing to, I guess, put yourself in that position, then you then you you're, you're going to face those kind of risks. Um, yeah, I, d I don't know if I've got the the right answer for that question. Yeah, I've, like I, yeah. I, but I, you brought up a very very good point because one of the big debates I think is also is risk management by the community or by the protocol or is risk management done by individual? Because I think yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of what we you know, like I mentioned before. I think we'll get to a point where we've got where we've got. Um, areas where where the protocols and the and the systems and the and um the governance and the DAOs that we've put in place kind of take on a lot more of the risk but there's always going to be individual risk and there should you know we as a decentralized as you know we are decentralized finance we can't take that away completely and something like in permanent loss i think whilst um we can certainly mitigate that and i know like i said projects that are that are, are helping to to solve for uh, mitigating that i don't think that it's our responsibility necessarily to take those kinds of risks completely away from the individual if that makes sense yeah that completely makes sense because one of the biggest it's almost like a philosophical shift in people which I think is one of the biggest risks in DeFi as well, is yeah. that we are living in this kind of like socialist, capitalistic world where the government takes on quite a lot of risk. That's why we're paying taxes. That's why we're paying them money. And that's great. One of the biggest power with decentralization is that we are decentralizing this power. We stop giving to this small segment of go people governing this, the country or system, and we distribute to everyone like you and me. The other, so that's great. Everyone loves power. That's awesome. What people forget is that when you have power, you actually have responsibility. And that means now you are responsible for your risk. Now you're responsible to be updated with what's going on. You have to be responsible or you are responsible for learning and, and improving your knowledge to figure out what's going on and how to, how to mitigate and manage your risk. And I feel like this is something that people don't want. They don't know how to do it. They're not used to doing this anyway. And suddenly giving them power and the responsibility at the same time it's very risky. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think, um, you know, you brought up Uniswap. I think, you know, they're doing a lot of, of really good work. Um, I think that DEXs in general as well, like, they, um, yeah, they're, 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 they're kind of maturing a lot uh, a lot faster now than they were, say, a year ago, and I think that's that's important. But, yeah, you, you, you're right, like, it's a it's a uh, that human element of of um of of kind of <laughs> responsibility and power is 
it's, it's always going to be a factor. But that's that's the same with 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 uh, TradFi, right? Like this is this is why, while whilst we can rebuild the systems, we can't re-engineer the people. <laughs> I guess that's that's kind that's of a very good thing. Yeah, we can <laughs> re-engineer people. We can keep re-engineering the systems and improving yeah. that. But we can't but, re-engineer people. Yeah. Yeah. And those they are actually, I guess, the biggest risk because the systems can be very robust, but if people are not using them right, then systems will definitely fail. So right. we have to upgrade people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that's a whole that's a whole other that's a whole other debate. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a, completely, um, you know, um, talk to Elon Musk about that one. Um, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think, um, yeah, look, it's lots of complex kind of issues, topics that we've that we've kind of covered. Um, I'm actually going to have to head off really soon, but um, but you know, like I, I, I really enjoy these conversations. Hopefully, we can build them up. I think Clubhouse is is getting a bit. Um, it's getting a bit noisy. I think they need to. There's some. There, there needs to be some better ways for us to um, to kind of manage these rooms. But um, I'm 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 enjoying the I'm enjoying the the topics that we've been going through, and I hope hope we can, can kind of continue doing them and build on them. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm going to head off for for a meeting. But but it's been it's been a pleasure. Awesome. It- is there anyone with other questions? Otherwise, I'll just take two minutes to summarize. Yeah, I mean, um, sorry, I just didn't want to interrupt you guys. You guys are in the middle of a pretty deep conversation. Uh, so far, the topics have been really good. Uh, I think one of the questions that you proposed or you asked was, how do you quantify risk? You know, I think, and this is something that I've, I've kind of witnessed in the past uh, six years being in this space, just the applicability of a mental model analysis, I think, regarding participating users given the stage of the market cycle in contrast to like the characteristics present in the users, given like an opposite mark- a stage of the market cycle is something that gets greatly overlooked. You know, I think if you're talking, if you talk to some of the most experienced builders in the space, the most common agreed notion between all builders in the space is that it's significantly easier to build in the bear market and it's significantly easier to raise in capital in the bull market. So that's be yeah, so, you know, because of that, you know, products launched in the current, in this current part of the market cycle uh, will, remain unproven no matter what until the market takes a downturn and sets them begin to change. So I think there's a, there's gotta be a higher level of like analysis on, on the mental models of the inflow of users because it's completely different today than what it was a year ago. You know, people that are in it right now have a, a different priority in terms of why they're in it. So, you know, if you don't consider all those different analyses, like it's your protocol mechanisms, not, it's just not gonna work. And that's something that kind of happened with Faye, but you know, I'll let you guys continue a little bit before I kind of go into Faye. Yeah, I think it's a good point, Roger. Like, um, yeah, it, it is overlooked for sure in terms of the the inflow of users and what and what they're looking for. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, but anyway, guys, I am gonna have to jump off, but um, I will uh, catch you very soon. And thanks a lot for uh, for this. See, bye bye. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you. So I'm just going to summarize. What's go- what we've talked about today. And we talked about the different kind of risks in DeFi. If we're talking about more of a systemic risk or the systems risk, there will be technical risk because all these executions are done in code and you have exploits in code, you have bugs in code. We've seen a lot of them in the DeFi world. We have economic exploits where this is a little bit more attuned to how systems are being designed, a little bit difficult to quantify and also the behaviors of people and community in the space that affects the doom loops, that affects how systems interact with the people. And we also talked about price volatility, where you need, it's the output of all these technical risk and economic exploits or systemic risk and human risk to give that output of prices. So that's one of the other risks. Then two other risks that we talked about is almost like the knowledge risk or education risk where it's a very specialized or centralized knowledge space, although systems are decentralized, but the, the knowledge is still centralized within a su- certain subsegment of people. And it's very hard to it's still very hard to get everyone up to speed and up to date of what's going on. And the other risk is the people risk. And people risk as in, you know, what kind of archetypes of people are in the space right now. So 
that helps a lot in qualifying risk in terms of analyzing how to understand the models and how to figure out whether this protocol in the community is risky or not. And the different kind of, and when it comes to risk, it's also important to realize or to, to note that the protocol doesn't take on all the different risks. As an individual, you made a choice to come in and it is also on your duty and on your part to take the responsibility to understand what's going on and take on some risk because you've made this decision and, and take responsibility of decision. It isn't always going to be a moonshots. Sometimes it's going to do a little bit badly and learn from that. Take it as a very expensive learning lesson. So that's it for today. Do you guys have any other questions? Um, nope, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Nope. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for coming. And probably have another session next week and we'll talk more about the different types of things going on in DeFi. Well, thank you guys very much and have a nice day, night or afternoon, wherever you are. Goodbye. All right. You too. Take care.